Welcome to today's lesson in Pinch Pot Piggy Banks. Today we're going to use a pinch pot technique to hand build a sculpture. We're going to create a stable and balanced freestanding piece of artwork. We're going to artistically emphasize the surface and contours of your artwork. And we're going to create a functional and hollow shell capable of holding coins. Here we can see that I've laid out some basic materials and tools to make a piggy bank. The tools are a wire loop and a wooden thumb, which is basically a thick stick, and a scoring tool, which is some toothpicks held together by some tape, a paintbrush for the slip, and then of course a finishing tool, which has a knife end and a nail end. I also have some slip laid out here. It's really um, sort of thick and gooey, and it's going to help us in this endeavor. Now, to make a piggy bank, the first thing I want to do is make a hollow shell where the coins are going to go in, and to do that, the easiest and quickest way is to make two pinch pots about the same size. And to make them the same size, I get two balls of clay that are about the same size to start with. And then I make them into nice smooth balls if I can. And once I've done that, I'm going to make two pinch pots that are about the same size so I can put them together and make a hollow shell. Remember, before we put things in the kiln, you have to have a way for the air to get out of that shell. And the slot on top of a piggy bank is going to be a great place for the air to escape. If you do not put a place for the air to get out, it will explode and your project will be toast. So let's not do that. Now that I have two spheres of about the same size, I can begin making a pinch pot. To do that, I'm going to find one edge on the sphere. It doesn't really matter where. And I push my thumb in and then I push my other thumb in. And I keep pinching the sides and the bottom until it gets about the same thickness all the way around. I can smooth things out especially when the clay is new. And so that way I can adjust how thick it is all the way around. And because these two spheres, these two balls of clay, are about the same size, they should very easily make a similar size of pinch pot. And that way I can put them together and make a sphere later. Well, it may not be a perfect sphere. It may be a little bit lumpy to start with, but we can smooth that all out as we go. So after pressing it until I find what appears to be about the proper thickness, you never want anything more than an inch thick. And to tell you the truth, about half an inch will do you, and you can get a little bit less than that when you're putting this together. Also remember that when you do make this, it will shrink um, up to 20%, usually more in the 10% range, depending on how wet the clay was to begin with. Now I'm making the second pinch pot. You can see I use the same method and I'm trying to get the walls about the same thickness as I go around and round. By taking the second sphere and starting the same as the first sphere, I can then put the two together eventually and see if they're about the same size. Right now I'm just making sure that the sides are relatively smooth and that they're oh, about the right thickness. And by adjusting that thickness, I can get the pinch pot one a little bit bigger. I can do, you do the same thing with the other one until I get them just about the same size, until they fit together, sort of like two halves of a coconut. As I go round and round, I'm adjusting now that I'm very close to the same size. Just adjusting little by little, testing, checking. I'm almost there, but not quite. Just needs a little bit of adjustment, so I make the first pinch pot just a little bit larger, and that should about do it right there. Okay, now that I've got the right size, I'm going to use the scoring tool, and I'm going to score all the way around, because that's the way I put them together there a moment ago to check the sizes, is the way I'm going to connect the two. And the edges need to be scored and really sort of chewed up quite a bit. You can see that those little toothpicks are just taped together in the middle. I've got five of them there and a piece of tape in the middle. And it makes them like a little comb. And I scrape all the way through and I go different directions so that when I put slip in there, it has some place to bite into. It's sort of like using glue on a rough surface, but you need a really rough surface with deep crevices if you, if you can get them. Now, if you make them too deep, you could run the risk of getting air pockets inside them. So you can see that I'm taking that slip and I'm putting it all the way around on the edges there 
so that the slip goes down into those crevices so that there's no air in the slip if I can help it. I want to get really gooey. So I get it gooey on one side and I'm using that brush and I'm going to get it gooey on the other side and I'm using the brush still and I'm getting it all down inside those crevices. Some people will tell you that you can use water and you can if you're very patient but to do that you actually have to make slip on the edge and this way we're starting with slip. Now slip like this or any slip is only good for bonding clay that is the same hardness together. If one is very dry and the other is very moist then it won't work right because one will shrink more than the other and the bond will come apart. You can see what I've done here is I've pressed it together and I want the slip to gush out the sides if I can and then I'm going to smooth over the entire seam all the way around making this into basically just a hollow ball. It's a hollow shell and there will be a little bit of a lip all the way around it for a while and I will smooth that out as much as I can right here. Now I'm going to press the seam together with my wooden thumb using a stick like this that is made of wood or some material that is stronger than the skin on my hands is usually a good idea because when you use your fingers and your thumbs they deform when you press the clay just like the clay deforms when they're when it's pressed by your fingers and when the two deform you only get the difference between them but with a stick like this that is much harder than the clay you can actually press with a more even pressure and get rid of that seam. Now the seam is on, still on the inside but we won't be seeing that in the future so we don't have to worry about that. Right now we're just trying to make sure that everything is smoothed over on the outside. And there are not as many lumps on the outside of this as I anticipated so I may not need to use that wire loop very much at all. A loop can quite often help you smooth off the outside edge of something whether it's a coil pot or a pinch pot or something that has lumps in it just by allowing you to shave bits off. But in this case I think I can just press most of those lumps down adding a little bit of slip to the surface to smooth it over and you can see that I'm once again using that wooden thumb to just give me a nice even pressure. By using the stick I can smooth things out more effectively and quicker than I can with my thumbs quite often. But the thumbs will often give me a nice burnished surface, a different feel to it than if I just use the stick in exclusion to everything else. And this looks pretty round, so I'm willing to work with this. At this point, most of the additions, although some of them will be structural, most will be either low relief textures or higher relief sculpted items so I'm going to start speeding up the video. As you can see here I am forming legs for this creature and one of my stipulations is that it stands or sits on some sort of legs and what I'm doing here is making posts and each one about the same size. They'll be adjusted as we go along some of them a little taller, some a little shorter as we get them just about the right size and eventually, as you can see, I've got a little too much clay there. We'll figure out how to put them on one side of this. Since I've lost my seam, actually I hid my seam, and since I don't have an up or down on this, I can pick whatever side I want. I can make it squarer or rounder as I see fit. Once I've figured out where to put those legs, I'm going to score both the leg ends and the body. So you can see that. And I get some slip on both sides, get it squishy inside so that it squishes out from underneath. I don't want it to look too neat at this point. I can clean up afterwards. But if I don't get it squishing out and into those crevices, I could get air gaps in there. And I don't want that. And I want to make sure that they are pretty well stuck on there. Remember, when you pinch something out of one piece, it's much stronger than when you join it. And all of these are joints, so they are inherently weaker than a solid piece. The trick is, or the goal is, to try and make it as close to one solid piece as you possibly can. And to do that, you need really gooey slip, and you need a lot of scoring in there to get the slip inside, and then you need to let it solidify in between and take some of that clay into the slip itself. So actually, it's not just slip on the scoring, it's slip in the scoring, 
and the wetness of the slip actually makes the clay itself into a little bit of slip on the edges. So there I've got some legs. The hollow body is a little bit thinner than is going to support this at this time, so I'm going to work on it mostly upside down, or at least what we might consider to be on its back, until I can actually allow the clay to harden enough to support itself. And you can see that I'm smoothing out now all those sections and I'm testing to make sure that it's going to stand on those four feet. When you're making legs, three in a triangle is the most is the simplest way to make something sit upright because three points define a plane. When you have four, quite often a fourth one will make it wobble. So to keep it from wobbling a bit, we need to test and retest. You can see that I'm making some pieces now to put on the side and these are going to give the illusion from the side that those legs aren't just stumps like tree stumps that it's standing on but actually the haunches of an animal and they could be the haunches of a pig or the haunches of any creature when I use the term piggy bank I'm not necessarily meaning that you need to make it look like a pig that's sort of the generic I should just say hollow bank shell but that doesn't sound quite as palatable as piggy bank so this is going to be a fantastical creature of your or maybe a dog I'm not sure at this point but it's not going to be a pig I've done pigs before and I just feel like I'm gonna do something else here as you can see I'm taking and I made a little slab and I'm sort of chewing up the edges there to sort of get one piece to smoosh into the others and I was using my wooden thumb there especially on the edges to try to get rid of the seams and I'm also using my fingers because I do have more control with my fingers and I can feel what I'm doing that way and with the tool it's harder to feel your way into it and then I take other little pieces of clay and I get them really wet and slippy and gooey before I try to form them into one piece and that's really what I'm trying to do here is form it so that it's as if it came out of one piece of clay and the only way to do that is when I have clays that are just about the same hardness so in this case I have all of this clay came from one lump and I'm using it all on the same day if you use it on several days you need to make sure that you keep everything stored together if you can and try to keep them with the same amount of moisture at this point I'm just going to speed up the video so that you can see the process Remember, every time you put something on the surface, you are creating a relief sculpture and you need to score and slip things in place. By adding more dimensionality this way through relief sculpture on the outside, you can create all sorts of different shapes. By pressing things into the surface, it's a low relief texture that you're putting in.
At this point I'm finishing up with the textures you can see and I have cut a slot in the top that's about an inch and a quarter long by about a quarter inch wide. That's about the right width so that when it shrinks you should be able to get a quarter or a smaller coin in there. You probably won't get a half dollar inside. Now let's take a look at some of the greenware. This of course is still wet and it's getting in the vicinity of leather hard a day later. You can see the textures are still there. You can see that I've put together Cerberus, the three-headed dog who guards the underworld. Now let's take a look at the bisqueware. This has been fired to a cone 06, which allows it to be solid enough to work with, yet porous enough to soak in the glaze so that when we do a glaze fire, it, it will shrink even more, locking the glaze into the surface. There are many ways to achieve multiple colors. You can use underglazes or multiple glazes. In this case, I'm going to start by staining the clay with some of the colorants that I would put in the glazes. That way I can use them in higher concentrations than I might put in a glaze and get a darker effect. And they will not affect the glaze as much by making it flux too low. On this collar, I'm using a solution of cobalt carbonate in water. I have to keep mixing it up because it doesn't like to stay in solution. This will render the areas that I paint it a dark blue. This collar is painted with a solution of manganese, cobalt, and iron, and it should be near black when it's completed. When it's fired, it will turn much darker. And this collar is painted with a solution of red iron oxide, basically rust that's suspended in water. Once again, it doesn't like to stay in solution. You have to keep mixing it up, but it will come out a dark, dark brown. Here I dunk the entire thing into my honey glaze, which is basically a clear with about 3% iron oxide, that same rust that's on the collar on the bottom. And it will come out sort of a tan color with a lot of detail. Several places that I wanted lighter glazes, I took a sponge and wiped off the glaze that I dipped it in and then reglazed those sections. In other areas where I wanted a darker glaze, I used a dark glaze with the same base on top of the glaze that I had already put there. So then here's the finished product. Notice that there are different colors of glazes on top. Some things are showing through. We have a lot of detail and one glaze on top of another creates a running effect. So let's look at the finishing criteria. Balanced and freestanding design, hollow shell with a coin slot at or near the top, standing or sitting on legs of some sort, use of two or more different low relief textures as well as high relief additions on the outside of the piece, a minimum of five inches tall before firing, minimum of two different colors after glaze fire, and the extra challenge, making the bank into a fantastic beast of legends. 
All of these have been met by Cerberus. Here's a couple of dragons and dinosaurs you can take a look at, but it could just as well be a pig.